Hi, it's Alistair at Electric Scotland. Just doing my uh, introduction to my uh, newsletter for uh, August the 9th, 2019. Um, I'm just making a, a, a little bit of a plea in my newsletter this time to, to support the uh, Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. Uh, it's the second longest running uh, history organization in the UK um, and frankly uh, I think uh, they need our support. It's not a great deal of money, it's 75 uh, pounds a year, great British pounds a year and if you retire you get it a bit cheaper. So if you're a retired member uh, over 65, then you get it, I think, for £57, I think it is. But I've given you a wee link uh, to their site where they tell you why they think you should join up and support them. And frankly, uh, I got some information in the, the other day there about the exam results in Scotland. And I found that uh, on the subject of history, uh, I, I note in the recent exam results from Scotch Education, the pass rates for English, maths and all three main science subjects all declined, which shows that our education system in Scotland is getting even worse. But they also commented there was an astonishing drop of almost 10 points for history. So I guess these students need to be told about my website because clearly, however, they're teaching history in Scotland, it's uh, pretty diabolical, the results. I mean, down 10 points, that's just ridiculous. So, anyway, at least I'm doing my bit. But I think maybe everyone needs to start telling more people about Electric Scotland. So the kids, in Scotland at least, can, can learn more. Okay, so anyway, uh, as to what I've got up for this week, uh, the news items are first from some Reuters. It says, UK plans to create up to 10 free ports to boost post-Brexit trade. As Britain plans to create up to 10 free ports to boost trade and manufacturing by cutting costs and bureaucracy after it leaves the European Union, the government said on Thursday. I believe there's a video on YouTube about Boris Johnson sitting in uh, Prime Minister's office and telling us about it, so kind of interesting. Okay, the next story is Popular Hotel unveils Edinburgh's largest fish supper. This is a popular tale in the capitals announced the introduction of Edinburgh's largest fish supper to its menu and its challenging diners to polish off the massive dish in its entirety. And there's a great picture of it as well. That came from the Scotsman. Then a BBC one, it says work starts on preserving secret seminary site in Moray. Work is underway in a £400,000 project to preserve the history of buildings on a site which once hosted a secret Roman Catholic seminary. The, the next one is from, again, from the Scotsman. It says, Tory grassroots turn on Ruth Davidson as popularity plummets. It says, Ruth Davidson's popularity among Tory grassroots members has plummeted since Boris Johnson's entry into Downing Street, a survey by an influential website suggests. Then uh, a Brexit Central article, uh, President Macron should realise it's in his interest to facilitate a quick and amicable clean break Brexit. It says when Boris Johnson addressed the House of Commons as Prime Minister for the first time last month, the scene from a packed parliament was broadcast to France. Okay, and then from the, another from the BBC it says EU officials 
no basis for further UK Brexit talks since EU negotiations told European diplomats changes suggested by the new UK government such as scrapping the Irish border backstop were unacceptable. So in actual fact, uh, the way things are going, you can vote uh, to take no deal off the table, but unfortunately we don't rule the roost. The European Union can say, ha, up you mate. And uh, so no matter what the stupid British Parliament says, the EU will tell us whether we can get it or not. You know, it's just, the Remainers are just mentally a bit simple, really, you know. At the end of the day, we need no deal. Once we do a no deal, we'll be completely out of the UK, the EU authorities, and then we can negotiate a proper trade deal with them afterwards. So, okay, from Jeb, John Redwood's diary, he's the MP I, I read a bit about, it says, Abidia which misinforms. This is the contrast between the way much of the conventional media reports on the European continent compared to the reports on the USA and UK has never been starker. So, I don't know, I think you should read that. Then from the Telegraph, it says Nicola Sturgeon accused of complacency as higher pass rate drops for fourth year in a row. Says more than 136,000 pupils across Scotland received the results on Tuesday with pass rates declining for every qualification except National 5. Disgusting. Terrible. Okay, uh, one from the Scottish Review. It's how to make Scotland a place we're proud to call home. It's Gary Hassan's commentary in the Scottish Review. And I have to say, he's usually very anti-Brexit and anti-the Tories as well. He's quite a left-wing character, but, you know, you do have to read other views. And then from another from Reuters, it says, Scary German output figures propel recession fears. Says German industrial output fell more than expected in June, driven by weaker production of intermediate and capital goods, and the further sign that Europe's biggest economy contracted in the second quarter as exporters get caught in trade disputes. And then from Think Scotland, it says slaughter of the lambs, all because of Brexit. At some point, as we close in on leaving the EU, the Ramoners would come up with something so absurd that the lunacy of their argument could only be appreciated at distance. You know, people getting caught up in Frederick Fiera are stupid. They really are. I'm sorry. It's just stupid. I mean, look at all the Project Fear. If we even voted to leave the EU, look at all the list of things that would happen. None of it came. And not only that, but we've completely reversed everything. We've never been so successful. You know, I mean, if you fear these stories, I would ask you to think carefully. You know, look at all the fear stories we got, and then go look at the facts for Pete's sake. And if you found that all these fear stories were actually lies, which they were, why are you believing them today? I mean, get a grip, folks. We need to be independent. We want to run our own affairs, not be told how to do things. And the Scottish independence people, more than anyone, should realise we need out of the EU. I mean, you, you don't like being told by Westminster what to do, so how much worse are you going to like Brussels telling you what to do? The fact that Nicola Sturgeon wants to be in the EU but out of the UK is the most stupid idea I've ever come across. So if you Scottish independence people want to be in the EU rather than under Westminster, good luck to you, because I tell you this much, you'll be dead as a country and I will enjoy your suffering. That's for sure, because that's all that's going to happen. They don't care about Scotland. They really don't care. And if you go to the, 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 um, the old Scots alliance with France, I mean, 
Scotland came out of that really, really badly. And the time we really needed French support, they didn't give us anything. So they take but never give. And that's, that's what's happening with the EU. Take but never give. And then an interesting story from the Globe and Mail in Canada. It says, after Brexit, Canada and the UK will become even closer friends. It says, words such as friend and ally sometimes fall short in describing the relationship between Britain and Canada. The ties that bind are so strong, the affinity between us so deep, that I prefer to think of our countries as different branches of the same family. So you might like to read you that. <coughs> <coughs> teenager in care almost starved to death. A severely brain damaged teenager who was in local authority care almost starved to death, a BBC Scotland investigation has found. You know, you should read that and you should be disgusted. I'm reading so many of these stories where basically the social services in Scotland are just rabid, horrible, nasty people. And the judges that support them should be fired or put in prison themselves. I mean, a lot of the time it's the judges that just go against honest justice in Scotland. The justice system in Scotland is broken. It's as bad as I've seen anywhere. It's perfectly legal to take children away from parents and give them no access to their parents afterwards. They treat these kids like rubbish. And no wonder there's so many suicides going on in Scotland. The justice system and social security in Scotland is terrible. And I blame the SNP. They are horrible people, the SNP people. They don't give a damn about anyone other than their own stupid little selves. And Nicola Sturgeon needs to go. She has to go. She's a whiner. She's done nothing. I mean, she says, judge me on education. We've judged her on education. It's terrible. She has to go. But she won't go. She lies all the time. Or lies by omitting facts. I mean, she's the one that said, the EU is the most important market for Scotland. But what she didn't tell us was that Two-thirds of the stuff we sell in the EU is actually sold to England alone. So England's clearly far more important a market than the EU. But you see, she misinterprets things. She puts spin on it. She's a spin artist. She's not an honest person. No honest person would be like Nicola Sturgeon. She's an example of how bad you, uh, a First Minister can be. We need to get rid of her. We need to get someone else in that will... In fact, I think we need the Tories in. I'm not saying the Tories would do better, but the Lib Dems didn't do any good for Scotland. The SNP certainly not done anything good for Scotland. We need the SNP. We need the Tories in there. Give them a chance. And if they fail, we've got to conclude that we're hopeless at running ourselves. And then we can either let the EU run us or Westminster run us. But frankly, I think we're a terrible state in Scotland politically. Terrible state. And, and obviously the, the SNPs, the MSPs are, are just pathetic on the whole. They couldn't govern themselves. I mean, look at all the, the horrendous, uh, uh, I mean, the social justice stuff is just terrible. In fact, I've got an article from Gary Hussain in the Scottish Review, which if you read it, he, he actually points out all of those problems that Scotland have got. But, uh, you know, I mean, when I read about that teenager in care, it's just one more of a long list of bad things that are happening in our social services and justice system. We're not fit for purpose. OK, the next one is, comes from Brexit Central. It's President Macron should realise it's in his interest to facilitate a quick, amicable, clean break Brexit. Uh, so when Boris Johnson addressed the House of Commons as Prime Minister for the first time last month, the scene from a packed parliament was broadcast to France. And of course, uh, I think actually if we hammer Macron, he'll just, in this fit of speak, will just tell us to go. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what the UK Parliament decides, he'll decide for us. Okay, national records for Scotland 
reject claim family records destroyed by leaks. That's the trouble with Scottish organisations, they lie all the time to us. A vast amount of Scotland's birth, death and marriage details for 1986 are among those completely destroyed by rainwater. But as usual, Scottish government organisation, it will spin it. But this is a very good report and it came from the Scotsman and people have seen records being destroyed. So don't trust any Scottish organisation. They're a bunch of spin artists. No transparency in Scotland anymore. Okay, so these are the stories I picked for you this week. Read them and weep. <laughs> okay, but do read that uh, giant fish supper in Edinburgh because if you're going to Edinburgh, have a bash of that giant fish supper. I love a fish supper, I have to say. Okay, on to Electric Canadian now. The Canadian horticulturalist uh, got volume 38 up for 1915. I think I misreported that last week actually, but. Uh, if I missed the volume, which I think I did miss, I think I had 36 up last week, when actually I put 37 up. So, But I have fixed it on the page, so if you go to the Canadian Horticulture, you'll be able to pick out each of the issues. Uh, so Oliver Mowat, a biographical sketch by C.R.W. Bigger, M.A., in two volumes, was produced in 1905 says Ontario has a grand old man in Sir Oliver Mowat, a man who was born in the year in which George III died and Queen Caroline was under trial, who came into the world as the great Napoleon went out and when Canada was under his first Governor General, Errol Dalhousie, and Lieutenant Governor Sir Peregrine Maitland was a familiar personage in what is now Ontario. So Oliver has seen the forest transformed into field and farm and the land peopled by thousands where scores once lived. Such a man is, in truth, growing old, but the growth is so gradual and new so tenacious in his hold of Ontario's premier that Father Time may well be disconcerted. Even in these days of high-pressure civilization. Sir Oliver might justly claim that his life, though comparatively long, has not only been active, but restful, resultful. He has filled uh, a great variety of positions, including those of ensign in a Kingston militia company, a practising attorneyship, the positions of school trustee and alderman, Queen's councillor and vice-chancellor, an LLD and MPP, Provincial Secretary and Postmaster General and Premier and Attorney General for 21 years. That's quite a record. So, you know, anyone that's been that successful, you really want to read these biographies because they teach you things, you know? Okay, the next story I've got is Early Days at York Factory by Beckles Wilson. In the year 1682, the Honourable Company of Merchants, Adventurers, trading into Hudson's Bay, decided to establish a second factory to be situated on the western side of the bay, in the vicinity of Fort Nelson. And so you can read about these early days of this new factory. Then I found a book about Canadian recipes. Um, I, I've hummed and hawed a bit about whether I should put that up or not. It's actually quite a large handwritten book that's been, uh, it's been created as a PDF file. And it's, of course, it's a lot of old Canadian recipes of all kinds. But I figured, well, there's people that like to collect recipes. So I decided I, I would put that one out. It's just that it's, I found some of them all quite hard to read because some of the things bleeding through uh, onto the next page and and so it's, it's not as actually easy to read but I don't know I, I I quite like these old recipes that are written down by our forefathers and stuff and so I think uh, I thought I'd put it up for those that enjoy these old recipes and then I posted up the Canadian Settlers Guides the seventh edition by Mrs. Trail Catherine Trail uh, we have another book up by her, which is, was really popular and 
people loved it. So I, I thought I'd add this book to that current page that we have for her uh, on the site. So the link's there for you to, to read. Um, and then finally I've got, I found Canada's Great War album. Um, so I've added to put a link to it from our Armed Forces page. But I thought, well, I'll give you the direct link to this to the site because there's some good stuff on it, some good videos as well. So that's what I got for Electric Canadian. Then Electric Scotland, some big publications this time around. First, I've got for you is Pickle the Spy by Andrew Lang. It's the third edition, produced in 1897. Says, as was to be expected, some Highlanders have declined to believe that Pickle was young Glengarry. Probably these gentlemen do believe the authenticity of Macpherson's Assignment. He says, I ought perhaps to have said before that I did what I could before publication to obtain rebutting evidence from the best source known to me without success. But it's, uh, well, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. Takes a. It's interesting about the count of the Jacobites in that one. And then Lays o' the Hameland by James H. Murdoch it was produced in 1911. Um, I'll give you the publisher's notice because it was partly because of that that I decided that I would make this available. It says, In all our long experience, never have we published a book that has given us more pleasure in the doing of it than Lays of the Hameland. The Scottish people here and everywhere are being done a distinct service in the publication of such a volume of poems, and I am to be congratulated that we have in our midst such a gifted Scottish bard with a mission in life which is trying to fulfil to the best of his ability. That this first great work of Mr. Murdoch will be appreciated by those for whom it was primarily intended, we confidently predict not only so, but all those who love really good poetry with an entertaining and uplifting purpose in it will revel in these verses. So that alone was enough for me to put it up. Then it goes on, it said, There is no doubt whatever that these lays will very soon permeate wherever Scotsmen gather, and that they will reap increment with the passing years, a reasonable prediction. Indeed, many of them will in due season be household words among our people. There is no Scottish poet living today that we know of who can approach Mr Murdoch in his uncomparable, simple, homely style which reaches to the heart and there is no book published at present just like this one, depicting the sweet, pure, natural life of the Scottish people and their beautiful country. For the merits of these poems are more understood and appreciated, and this is sure to happen, there will spring up a demand for them that will be hard to keep pace with. Like all these other worthy Scots, Mr Murdoch is modest, but the urgent solicitation of his many friends prevailed with him to set these poems before the people in book form. There should be no qualms as to the result, and it is to be hoped that he will be induced and encouraged to keep on edifying and entertaining us in his own happy and gifted way. So I want to say this collection will make a very suitable Christmas present to send a brother or sister Scott anywhere. Indeed, is suitable as a gift at any time. The pleasure these beautiful poems will afford cannot be computed. We ask for the author a generous supply of that encouragement, which true Scots everywhere, of whatever station in life, never were known to withhold to a worthy thing or cause, and that they will do all in their power to help along the sale of the book. Mr. Murroch, like many others who have benefited the world by their presence and work, is not a rich man, so far as this world goes, and cannot hope to make anything out of this volume except the appreciation of his grateful fellow countrymen, from whom he has laboured so long and earnestly in his special field 
for which its natural gifts are so eminently fitted. Yet financial stimulus is also a necessary thing in this world, and such a form of encouragement, along with the heart's appreciation, should make a combination that would go far towards perpetuating and even further enlarging his work among and for us. In Mr. Murdoch we have a helper. He's trying to benefit the world by his labours. Should we not also do our part by him? In actual fact, it sounds like he's very like Robert Burns. Anyway, I did read some of his poems and thoroughly enjoy them, so I uh, there's a lot more uh, to this uh, review, so I hope you read it and read his book of poems. Okay, um, and talking of poems, a recording of the four Ardmore Whiskey poems. Sam Bruce has recorded his four poems in audio, and you can listen to them and read them uh, on his page. Uh, I will just say that the... Um, if you read the page, because if you want to read the poems rather than listen to them, then there's a link to the audio recording uh, at the top of the Doric version, because it's the Doric version that he actually um, records. But I've also given you a link directly to the audio uh, version, it's an M4A file. Okay, a history of the Highlands and the Highland clan with an extensive selection from the hitherto inedited Stuart Papers by James Brown, LLD, Advocate. It's a new edition with numerous illustrative engravings in four volumes. It was produced in 1850. And because the Stuart Papers played quite a major part in that, I hunted for the Stuart Papers, and so I'm now bringing you calendar of the Stuart Papers. It's belonging to His Majesty the King, preserved at Windsor Castle in seven volumes. As the previous volumes referred to these papers, I thought I'd search for them and found a seven-volume collection. So I've now made these available. The papers included in the following calendar belong to His Majesty the King and preserved in the Lord Library at Windsor. They were formerly the property of the titular King James III, otherwise the Old Pretender, and his sons, Charles Edward, and Henry, the Cardinal Duke of York. An account of the acquisition of papers uh, can be read on that page as well. Okay, and then I was looking for MacLeod. Uh, I was putting a book up because I found out uh, the MacLeods of Arnisdale. <coughs> and usually when I put a, up a book on a clan page, uh, I normally have a reference to the clan within the... Uh, the uh, Scottish National, sorry, the, the, the National History of Scotland, but uh, essentially the Scottish Nation, sorry it's called. But I didn't have a link to it, and I thought, oh, I have to put a link to that, I missed it. So I went, and I couldn't find MacLeod on the Scottish Nation at all, and I thought, that's ridiculous. So I went and found another copy of the Scottish Nation, and there, there is an entry from a cloud, so clearly for some reason we've missed them. So I've also added that in, and I've now added the MacLeod into the Scottish Nation. So that's kind of updated that book. I've actually got, um, I had to download copies of the Scottish Nation to get the MacLeod one, but I'm thinking maybe I've missed something else. So I think what I'm going to do, maybe next week, I'll put up the three volumes of the Scottish Nation so that if you think I've missed something, you can refer to the original documents there. Because these were ones I did uh, uh, many, many years ago now, so clearly I missed them. Okay, and then the final one is an essay on the improvements to be made in the cultivation of small farms by the introduction of green crops and house feeding the stock thereon with a, a preface by William Blacker. It's the fifth edition produced in 1837. So as you know, I really like old uh, agricultural books and stuff, so that one's up. Then, the story I have for you this week is, I uh, just thought I'd finish up with the, because I've given you things on malware and viruses, so this one is, how do I prevent computer viruses? 
So it's preventing computer viruses from affecting your computer starts with situational awareness. It's a much shorter article than the other one I gave you last week. So, and I also, within it, given you a link to where, if you suspect there might be a problem on your computer, I've given you a link to the Malware Bytes free premium trial for Windows and for the Mac. So if you click either of those links, uh, you can download a, a free trial copy, and that will at least tell you if your computer's got a problem or not. And I've made a wee note that I've, for many years now, I've used malware bytes myself. It's permanent on my computer. I've also got the Trend uh, micro uh, antivirus software on my computer because they were also working on the ransomware blocking. And I was a bit worried because ransomware can be horrible and nasty. And I've made a wee note that I still use my click free hardware device. Um, basically when I plug in click free it automatically recognizes it and comes up and um, when you do the first complete backup I mean like I uh, I think that if I, maybe every six months or so I reformat that device and start a brand new backup and so I did that it usually takes almost 24 hours to run to get the full backup with my system because it's I've got a lot of stuff on my hard drive but thereafter, it, it, it only takes maybe half an hour to do an incremental backup. And you can do this for up to six months. And as I say, I think six months is enough. And so at the end of six months, I usually reformat the drive and do a completely new one again. So I've just, in fact, done that um, uh, just last night, in fact. So it finished about an hour ago, I think. So... I hope you enjoyed that article and uh, explains a bit about what it's all about, what viruses are, because viruses basically are, uh, is an old issue. I think malware bites probably is the more modern antivirus as it were, but I, I tend to keep both. And as I say, I haven't had a problem with my computer for a long time, but if I hit a, a ransomware, the screen came up. I frankly just need to plug in my uh, click free device and just restore. It's not a problem. So I can get around man somewhere with, do it with doing that. But you need to back up your system. If you don't back it up daily, you, you know, you, you, it's your fault really. you got problems. Okay, so that's what I've got for you this week. So I hope you have a great weekend when it comes. And. Uh, as always, any comments, uh, uh, any advice, any, any useful, if you're looking for some specific information, can't find it, let me know. But, you know, if you don't communicate with me, I can't uh, take any of your thoughts into account. So, hopefully you'll be in touch with some comments and suggestions even. Okay, so, as I say, have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.